What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Don't Give Up The Shit Podcast. This one's going to be a little different. Uh, I've been talking about it for a while, and I'm finally getting the first one in here. This is History and Heritage Volume 1. I'm so excited to finally bring some of the Heritage stuff back. I, I used to do the history segments at the beginning of each episode. And now that I've gotten it more into uh, interview formats, which I'm still going to try to find time to do some of the episodes where we're doing like policy or program based stuff as I've gotten some requests for that. But what I'm, I'm probably going to also do a lot more interviews, which with them being as long form as they are, uh, it's, I don't want to tack on another 30 minutes of history stuff. And I've always kind of wanted to delve a little deeper into it. So, uh, I'm going to start doing history and heritage episodes. Um, I'm starting off with one of my favorite humans uh, as far as naval history is concerned. And uh, it was the idea came uh, from the announcement that they are naming an aircraft carrier after this man. Uh, and it got me excited because I'm a cook. Uh, so <laughs> naturally, I'm going to start with my own community and one of my heroes. Uh, and so for History and Heritage Volume 1, we're going to be talking about the Dory Miller story really excited to to dive into this uh you will see more of these i have a couple more planned already they do take a lot of research uh to get a, an outline put together to make this happen so um when i when i can get those done i will and we'll get into this one which i'm really excited about so like i said we're naming an aircraft carrier after a cook which it's very easy for a guy like me to get so excited about that concept because uh as a former instructor and just a, a senior leader in the community it's very difficult at times to get CSs, formerly MSs, and stewards and commissary men and such before that. That it, it, it was there are times where uh, you don't feel valued and where people go out of their way to let you know that your job's not quite as important as what they do, right? Which um, it, it's a battle to convince intelligent adults that it is in fact not true and and that. You're, you're the most important piece of it being that you're a sailor first and that it, your job is very, very valuable to the organization as well. So uh, just name, naming a, a carrier after one of my heroes and just an incredible naval hero at all uh, that rose to the occasion during Pearl Harbor to save lives and create an inspirational legacy as the first African-American to ever earn a Navy cross uh, for combat heroism. I mean, it just, it's, it's super exciting. It makes me happy. I know a lot of friends that are really excited about it and, uh, it's just awesome. Dory Miller is a hero by any definition of the word, not because he was black, not because he was a cook and not because of the person that he was. It's because all those things came together to build an incredible human being when faced with an impossible situation rose to show all of us the living embodiment of who we all strive to be every day when we pull this uniform on. So a lot of what I pull from is from an incredible book that I highly, highly recommend you checking out. And as I get into explaining that, uh, the outline for this podcast and the show notes include all of the links and references and everything that I use for the research. So uh, not just for the credit of the people that did all that tough work to make sure these things were appropriately chronicled, but also if you want to learn more, check these things out. Uh, and the book that I used was called The Messman Chronicles. It's a book I learned about through an article released through a publication that's unique to the CS community. It's a quarterly newsletter that we get. Uh, and there was an article when it got put out. It's by a retired hospital corpsman chief, which it, it's really chronicling the, the struggle of uh, African-American service members uh, in, in not just joining the Navy, uh, but getting recognized as uh, able to do something besides just be a cook, right? Which I, I hate saying out loud because my community gets pointed at and told they're just cooks when they're underestimated and when they're marginalized, uh, which it, it, it happens. Um, I, I have conversations with people trying to identify if it's been unique to submarines for me or if it happens everywhere. And the, the, the impression that I get based on those conversations is it happy happens everywhere to varying degrees. Uh, it's getting better. Um, but over my eight now 18 plus years, uh, it's definitely been a constant state, uh, as, as I've been a part of the community, but, uh, I read this book. It's by Richard E. Miller. Again, it's called the Messman Chronicles. It's incredible. It doesn't just talk about Dory Miller or, or commissary men and stewards and ships cooks and the, their progression it talks about, 
the struggle to open up all rates to uh, people of color. So it's it's a really great book. Highly recommend checking it out. Um, but let's dive into Dory Miller's story. So the nickname Dory would eventually take hold, but the third son of Connery and Henrietta Miller seems never to have resented the more feminine sounding name his mother gave him, Doris. The name apparently came from his mother's strong desire for her third child to be a girl. His family grew up as tenant sharecroppers on a small farm in Spiegelville, McClellan County, Texas. The boys worked hard but enjoyed hunting, and Doris even took up taxidermy, mounting his hunting trophies. He grew up to be an athlete, standing 6 feet 3 inches, weighing 225 pounds. He was a standout on Waco's Moore High School football team. After joining the Navy, he would also excel as a heavyweight boxer. But all his friends described him as a quiet, mild-mannered young man that was finicky about his personal appearance. Doris attempted to enlist in the Army and Civilian Conservation Corps before turning 18, but his parents refused consent. On September 16, 1939, he enlisted in the United States Navy out of Dallas to be a mess attendant. A shipmate from boot camp, Thomas Muzan, recalls their training at Unit B East. Most in the class were high school graduates. We trained under a black steward named G and a white chief bosun's mate who I didn't like named Barlow. We were taught how to serve, right side, left side, what to put here, what to put there. We also had the regular boot camp routine, but strictly segregated. A special time to go to the swimming pool or whatever, so we wouldn't be mixed with the white recruits. We were there 12 weeks. When we went out on Liberty in Norfolk, we had to wear these leggings with our uniforms to distinguish us as quote unquote boots. We used to hang out at the Titanic bar on church street and the first chance we'd get, we'd take off our leggings and relax. That is all of us, all of us, except Doris. He went strictly by the book, even at the hangout, his feet were so big. He had to wear civilian shoes until the Navy had some specially made for him. He was a huge guy and a fine young man. It's not exactly known where the nickname Dory actually came from, but Thomas Muzan claims he was always known as Doris at Unit B East, and that nickname was one given by the press following his actions at Pearl Harbor. Alternatively, a shipmate on the USS Indianapolis claims that messmen customarily assigned each other nicknames and that all the messmen preferred calling him Dory. Following training at Naval Station Norfolk, Miller was assigned to the ammunition ship USS Pyro, AE-1, where he served as a mess attendant and on 2 January 1940 was transferred to the USS West Virginia, BB-48, where he became the ship's heavyweight boxing champion. In July of that year, he had temporary duty aboard the USS Nevada, BB-36, at Secondary Battery Gunnery School. He returned to the West Virginia on 3 August and was serving in that battleship when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. Miller had arisen at 6 a.m. and was collecting laundry when the alarm for general quarters sounded. He headed for his battle station, the anti-aircraft battery magazine amidship, only to discover that torpedo damage had wrecked it, so he went on deck. Because of his physical prowess, he was assigned to carry wounded fellow sailors to places of greater safety. Then an officer ordered him to the bridge to aid the mortally wounded captain of the ship. He subsequently manned a 50 caliber Browning anti-aircraft machine gun until he ran out of ammunition and was ordered to abandon ship. Miller described firing the machine gun during the battle, a weapon which he had not been trained to operate. It wasn't hard. I just pulled the trigger and she worked fine. I had watched the others with these guns. I guess I fired her for about 15 minutes. I think I got one of those Japs planes. They were diving pretty close to us. During the attack, Japanese aircraft dropped two armored-piercing bombs through the deck of the battleship and launched five 18-inch aircraft torpedoes into her port side. Heavily damaged by the ensuing explosions and suffering from severe flooding below decks, the crew abandoned ship while the West Virginia slowly settled to to the harbor bottom. Of the 1,541 men on the West Virginia during the attack, 130 were killed and 52 wounded. Subsequently refloated, repaired, and modernized, the battleship served in the Pacific Theater through the end of the war in August of 1945. I'm now going to read letters chronicling what happened during the attack on Pearl Harbor from officers that were there, uh, and these accounts were subsequently used for his award recommendation. So Lieutenant F.H. White aided Miller in hauling people along through oil and water to the quarterdeck, thereby unquestionably saving the lives of a number of people who might otherwise have been lost. From Lieutenant J.G. F.H. White, USNR, to the Navy Department. 
Subject, Statement of Japanese Attack on December 7, 1941. At 0756, approximately, I was in the ward room when the fire and rescue party was called away by bugle. I ran to the quarterdeck. The first thing I saw on reaching topside was a Japanese plane over a ship ahead of the West Virginia from which a column of water and smoke was rising. As I ran forward, I stopped at the deck office and sounded the general alarm just as the first torpedo struck the ship. En route to my battle station, in secondary forward, I noticed no one in charge of the anti-aircraft battery on the boat deck where the crews were manning the guns, so I remained there and took charge of the battery, breaking out the ready service ammunition, forming an ammunition train, and getting the starboard guns firing local control. The ship had received three or four torpedo hits, which threw oil and water all over the decks, which combined with the list to approximately 25 degrees, made footing very precarious. Due to the list of the ship, the port gun crews were brought to starboard as their guns would not elevate sufficiently. The air to the guns had gone out, which necessitated depression for hand loading. While the guns were in action, several bombs dropped on or near the ship, but the discipline on the guns were excellent. When the ammunition in the ready service box was expended, I went below to see if more ammunition could be brought up. In passing through Times Square, I picked up four hands from the secondary battery who accompanied me, going down the hatch from Times Square to ATAC 605, then to ATAC 511. In ATAC 511, water was up to the airports on the port side and extended to the center line. One battle port was not dogged down, which one hand of my detail took care of. The starboard armored hatch from ATAC 511 to ATAC 420 was open, but ATAC 420 was flooded to within a few inches of the hatch. A great many injured men were lying on the deck or in the water in ATAC 511, whom I ordered my detail to evacuate to Times Square. I returned to Times Square, where Ensign TJF Ford was in charge of the second battery, which was not at the moment engaged, and ordered second battery personnel to evacuate all injured from second and main decks to Times Square. From there, I returned to the anti-aircraft battery, where I reported to Lieutenant Commander D.C. Johnson that ammunition could not be brought up and informed him of the situation below decks. Lieutenant Commander J.H. Harper saw me and told me to go to the bridge and bring down the captain who was wounded. Lieutenant C.V. Ricketts, Ensign V. Delano, CSM Sywart, D. Miller, Mess Attendant 2nd Class, and several signalmen were on the signal and flag bridges in the immediate vicinity of the starboard admiral's walk where the captain was lying. The captain's abdomen was cut apparently by a fragment of a bomb, about three or four inches with part of his intestines protruding. The captain deserves the highest praise, for although he was in great pain, his only concern was for his ship and the crew. The captain did not want to be moved, but he was carefully carried to shelter abaft the conning tower where Leek, chief pharmacy mate, administered first aid. Under direction of Lieutenant Ricketts, material to construct a stretcher on which to lower the captain was procured, while D. Miller, mess attendant second class, and I manned number one and number two machine guns forward of the conning tower. A serious oil fire from the galley spread to the mast structure with flame and thick black smoke preventing our lowering the captain forward to the conning tower, although an unsuccessful attempt was made. The smoke and flames prevented us from seeing more than a foot or two, and the heat was intense. I helped place the captain on top of the searchlight forward of the conning tower and tried to untie the lashing which secured him to the improvised stretcher, but was unable to do so. I then went aft, groping my way to the other side of the signal bridge, bringing the enlisted men with me to look for something to cut the lashing. Lieutenant Ricketts was by the starboard signal bags, and I reported to him, and he went forward to take a look, followed by Miller and me. The captain's stretcher had slid aft with the captain's head down and the lashing loosened. The four of us carried him aft and up to the navigation bridge where we laid him on the deck under shelter of the port anti-aircraft director and out of the flame. The life jackets, stowage, and signal bags were burning by this time, and Lieutenant Ricketts, Seawert, and I threw burning flags over the side. A fire hose was sent up by heaving line, which I used to try to fight the fire, but the pressure was insufficient. By this time, the bridge was burning to the starboard and the signal bridge all over. Ensign Graham went up to the starboard boat crane and sent over a line which we secured to the rail on the bridge and used to cross the carn and thence to the boat dock. From then until relieved, I fought the fire. Lieutenant C.V. Ricketts deserves the highest commendation for his exemplary inspiration and leadership. 
Had he not counter flooded, it is almost certain the West Virginia would have capsized as did the Oklahoma. His presence of mind, cool judgment, and complete disregard of personal safety are an inspiration to all hands. Signed, F.H. White, Lieutenant J.G., USNR. I'm now going to read another little synopsis of some of the actions uh, sent by Lieutenant C.V. Ricketts. The personnel that worked with me on the bridge, I cannot commend too highly. They carried out every order promptly and enthusiastically, even when it meant danger to themselves. They did not attempt to abandon the bridge until ordered to do so. These personnel were Lieutenant Junior Grade F.H. White, Ensign V. Delano, Sywert, Leak, and Miller. Two or three other men, signalmen, I believe, were also present. Lieutenant Junior Grade F.H. White is to be especially commended for his great help, many suggestions, and disregard of personal danger. Ensign Graham and Ensign Lombardi provided us a means of escape by passing us lines from the starboard crane and by directing the firefighting on the after side of the mast structure. Signed, Lieutenant C.V. Ricketts. So all these reports uh, were sent up, and this all led to uh, what we all know. We all know how he was recognized, uh, and this kind of leads into that. While hastily preparing for the Battles of Coral Sea and Midway in May 1942, the commander of the Pacific Fleet, Admiral Chester Nimitz, made time for an award ceremony on board the carrier Enterprise on 27 May 1942. Authorizing the award of the Navy Cross on 11 May and making a public announcement on 14 May, Admiral Nimitz lined up eight white officers and one black enlisted man to receive their awards for actions during the attack on Pearl Harbor, including mess attendant second class Doris Miller. Citation. For distinguished devotion to duty, extraordinary courage, and disregard for his own personal safety during the attack on the fleet in Pearl Harbor, territory of Hawaii, by Japanese forces on December 7th, 1941. While at the side of his captain on the bridge, Miller, despite enemy strafing and bombing, and in the face of a serious fire, assisted in moving his captain, who had been mortally wounded, to a place of greater safety, and later manned and operated a machine gun directed at enemy Japanese attacking aircraft until ordered to leave the bridge. On 13 December 1941, Miller reported to the USS Indianapolis, CA-35, and subsequently returned to the west coast of the United States in November of 1942. Assigned to the newly constructed USS Liscombe Bay, CVE-56, in the spring of 1943, Miller was on board that escort carrier during Operation Galvanic, the seizure of Macon and Tarawa Atolls in the Gilbert Islands. Liscombe Bay's aircraft supported operations ashore between 20 to 23 November 1943. At 5.10 a.m. on 24 November, while cruising near Taritari Tari Island, a single torpedo from Japanese submarine I-175 struck the air- escort carrier near the stern. The aircraft bomb magazine detonated a few moments later, sinking the warship within minutes. Listed as missing following the loss of that escort carrier, Miller was officially presumed dead on 25 November 1944, a year and a day after the loss of the Liscombe Bay. Only 272 sailors survived the sinking of the Liscombe Bay, while 646 died. In addition to the Navy Cross, Miller was entitled to the Purple Heart Medal, the American Defense Service Medal, Fleet Clasp, the Asian Pacific Campaign Medal, and the World War II Victory Medal. When the attack on Pearl Harbor happened, the beginnings of the American Civil Rights Movement were forming, and at the time were focused on equal opportunities for black Americans. On June 25, 1941, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt issued Executive Order 8802, promising equal opportunity for any race to be employed in the country's defense industries. Immediately following that, however, the U.S. Army issued strict Jim Crow segregation guidelines for its force. The Bard Committee was commissioned to consider racial reform in the Navy and Marine Corps, and many expected similar Jim Crow-type policies to come down. However, on December 7, 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, killing 2,403 Americans and wounding 1,143 while gravely damaging the Pacific Fleet. This galvanized the populace, calling for unity of all races to fight the scourge of the Empire of Japan. NAACP attorney Charles Houston debunked the often-touted thought process that racial integration of the Navy would erode battle efficiency by pointing at the actions of black Americans like Dory Miller at Pearl Harbor. Having not enlisted black sailors as anything other than messmen since 1922, this began the uphill battle towards total integration and equality of of opportunity to pursue any rating specialty. 
which was won in April of 1942, albeit with Jim Crow type segregation policies attached. Now I'm going to talk about some of his legacy outside of what we just discussed with his impact on uh, opening up ratings to uh, all races, even though they ended up being segregated. So later on, these things were fixed. And and I just want to talk about that and how it was done and some of the other resources you can kind of check out to learn more about that. But part of his legacy was laying the groundwork for those things to happen. So after the foundation was laid with Executive Order 8802, when Admiral Elmo Zumalt was selected at 49 years old, he was the youngest chief of naval operations ever, which led to the battle for equal opportunity in our Navy being won. Admiral Zumalt believed it was his job to modernize and humanize the Navy, yet he is especially remembered for his progressive personnel programs. To articulate his position on the changes he planned, Admiral Zumalt implemented a series of naval messages given the moniker Z-Grams. The first Z-Gram was released the day he took office. A torrent of these missives followed. The first 92 of a total of 120 came out in his first year in office. They addressed personnel matters that Admiral Zumwalt described as Mickey Mouse issues that he believed were partially responsible for plummeting retention of a force attained through the draft. But not all Z-grams dealt with Mickey Mouse issues. Some were the foundation of policies that remain in effect today. During Admiral Zumwalt's term as CNO, the Navy, like the nation, experienced racial unrest. In z Tax 66 dated December 17, 1970, Admiral Zumwalt noted, There is significant discrimination in the Navy. However, he didn't shrink from it. We do have problems, and it is my intention to take prompt steps toward their solution. He directed each command to appoint a special assistant for minority affairs with direct access to the commanding officer, and for commanders to ensure a minority group wife was included in the ombudsman program. He also directed that the Naval Supply Systems Command renew emphasis on meeting the special needs of minority groups in ship stores and other service organizations. He understood this was just the beginning and committed to further study and action. To emphasize his determination, he gave commanders until January 15, 1971, less than a month, to take action on the directives. He wrapped up the Z-Gram saying, There is no black Navy, no white Navy, just one Navy, the United States Navy. Minority firsts in the Navy in the succeeding years can trace their roots to Z Gram 66. A lot of things that I learned about Admiral Elmo Zumwalt and equal opportunity in the Navy uh, first came from a book called Navigating the Seven Seas. Uh, it's by Melvin Williams Sr. and Melvin Williams Jr. Uh, one was a chief steward and uh, he went on to be a command master chief and worked directly with Admiral Zumwalt, who kind of used him as a sounding board. Uh, and then his son was a vice admiral who commanded a fleet before he retired. Um, so you can get some incredible insight into how equal opportunity happened by reading that book and the experiences of command master chief and steward Melvin Williams senior and his son, vice admiral Melvin G Williams. Um, master chief Williams was one of the first black submarine qualified command master chiefs of a large surface ship, which is unique because he was a submariner uh, and vice admiral, Williams was the first black commanding officer of a ballistic missile submarine ever. Uh, it details Master Chief Williams' time working for Admiral Zumwalt, like I mentioned before, and his advising him on the creation of equal opportunity policies, as well as the integration of uh, commissary men and stewards into the mess management specialist rating, which is what I was when I joined the Navy. Uh, it's an incredible leadership resource, and it doesn't just talk about that. It's a it's a leadership book. Um, they literally have the seven C's, which are uh, their leadership principles, and, and they go into depth on each of those. And it's an amazing book, and I, I highly recommend checking it out. The link to that is in the show notes and on the outline. So some more legacy for uh, Dory Miller He had a ship named after him already, believe it or not. Uh, USS Miller DE-1091 was commissioned on 30 June 1973. And then there was a frigate, a Knox-class frigate, was also named the Dory Miller, FF-1901. But now, the one I talked about before, the USS Dory Miller CBN-81 is on the way. And then, as I mentioned before, uh, a huge part of his legacy is what we now know as the Equal Opportunity Program. OPNAV Instruction 5354.1 Golf, the Navy equal opportunity instruction it's a 
it's a program that exists today. And he had a huge hand in that um, by being the inspiration for pressuring naval leadership at the time to allow uh, all races to enlist as whatever rating they wanted. I served as a, a command manager, equal opportunity manager, or as a simio. Like I went to a school for that, and there are really serious processes put in place to ensure that the equal treatment of everyone, regardless of race, color, creed, sexual orientation, religion, ethnicity, gender, or any other thing you can think of. Dory Miller played a hand in that, and it's a big deal. It's a huge part of his legacy, and it's really important. I'm really glad to just be able to share this story uh, with who, whoever. Uh, is is listening not just with culinary specials which it's it's something I've talked about a bunch before with the CSs that I've had direct contact with but just with everyone for the story to be out there and for people to be aware of it uh, Dory Miller's my hero it, like if you were to randomly encounter me and ask me who my biggest naval hero is it's him without hesitation and it's because he defines the underestimated marginalized human with every reason in the world to fail but he didn't he rose to the occasion and did what he ne needed to be done for people that he owed nothing but everything at the same time it it's so mind-bending to think about for a human to be in that place and without hesitation risk life and limb for his commanding officer and shipmates and save countless lives by leaping onto a gun turret that hours earlier he would have been disciplined for touching like, I can't emphasize this one enough. I used incredible naval heroes like him to motivate my culinary specialist A school students when they were often sent to us for struggling academically at other schools or not cutting a high enough ASVAB score. We were sent the sailors that were deemed to be the fleet's failures, which to me as a leader and a steward both infuriates me and excites me. Like, bring it. Send all of them. Send them to the home of Dory Miller. Send them to the building that William Pinckney and Leonard Harmon built. Let them come grow as sailors and humans in the same place that produced six Medal of Honor recipients and is the birth birthplace of the Navy chief. Send them to me. Send them to us and I'll build outstanding sailors first that when put in extraordinary circumstances, respond accordingly, because that's what we do. I, I, I never, ever will accept anyone ever saying that you're just a cook. And for all of my cooks that are listening, and I know you are, this is the story that you point to. You bring up the fact that there are ships named after Leonard Harmon and William Pinckney. And if you don't know those stories, look it up and learn them because they're important. It's an important thing to be able to point at. It's an important thing to be able to remind a Navy chief that the first mention of the term chief in relation to Raider rank was, you guessed it, a ship's cook named Jacob Wasby that served with John Paul Jones on the USS Alfred. Look it up. That we have six Medal of Honor recipients. You think I'm wrong? Look it up. That there are those types of heroes. That are part of your story. You're part of this now. This is your story. This is your lineage. Of your community. Take pride in that. Take ownership of that. Get that story out to your sailors. Let them know that you're not just anything. That you get to be part of this community. That you get to be a culinary specialist and a cook. And you get to be part of that heritage. I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations with sailors about this and they have no idea or awareness of it. And that's, that's a sad story. And that's one of the biggest reasons why I want to do episodes like this is to get this type of content out to you through a medium that's digestible to you and easily accessible to you and easily shareable for you. And I, I would really encourage and, and I ask you to share this with as many people as possible just so that the awareness is there. Um, 
it's something I'm really passionate about. It, I think history and heritage is it's not just important so we can understand where we came from. It's not just important so that the story gets passed on. It's the reasons why we want those things to happen. I want those things to happen so that these cooks out there in the fleet have the pride and ownership of 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 knowing that they're part of this that you're part of this story it's yours now that there are people out there doing incredible things all the time and they continue to do so there's no shortage of cs's out there doing amazing things and i'm really excited to see what happens next if anybody needs anything from us, hit us up. Don't give up the shit podcast at gmail.com. You can Facebook message me at don't give up the shit podcast, or you can DM me on Instagram or Reddit at Degas podcast. Uh, we have a, a sub and then you can find me Degas podcast on Reddit uh, for both the sub and my username. You can DM me or, or interact with us there. I'll post the episode on Reddit. Uh, I encourage you to interact um, there. It's a good place to have discussions and stuff, uh, not just with me, but with the other people in the sub. And then, uh, yeah, let us know if you need anything. Let us know if you got questions, comments, or concerns. And then let me know if you need anything from us uh, or have suggestions on what I should do next as far as history episodes and the like. Uh, I'm looking at uh, doing a few more of these and then obviously open to ideas. Um, And then if you would, like, share, subscribe, review, do all the things to help us out and get the word out. And that's it. That's what I got for you today. Thank you so much for listening and don't give up the ship.